worth more than an hour of your time. You're a human being, and I'm a human being. You know, why should, why should you get more money than me? Because of what you have inside you. You know, because somebody, or another example, because somebody has more pieces of paper in his pocket, why should that person have a nice com comfortable seat on the train and somebody else should not? Why should the people on a business, on a you know, first class, business class in a plane have all of the luxury and comforts and the rest of them crammed like sardines into the, into the back? Just again because of the number of pieces of paper in your pocket. Yeah? So these sort of things, we, we don't challenge, we just accept them as givens. Um, and he's basically saying labor and wages do not even belong in the economic world. Labor and wages are actually a, an aspect of rights. Yeah? Mm -hmm. Um, and they need to be separated from the, the economic realm as such. And the labor and, and wages need to be um, not just given out by the state. So he wasn't saying the state should give everybody the same wage, for example. But rather that the, the situation in which you find yourself working for, for example, a, 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 a company, um, your personal circumstances need to be taken into account. So, you know, if you're a young worker, unmarried, for example, your needs are of a certain kind, and they're different from the needs of a married, a married worker with supporting a family and so on. Well, these, these kind of things are not taken into account at all, or mostly not, right? Today. They were. They were. They were. The tax system and everything like that. They yeah. Yeah. It's only been the last five, ten, fifteen years that that has proved to be changed. Yeah. Yeah. There's yeah. changes changes taking place in this area. Yeah, but the, the problem is, have we moved from a good system, mm. or well, a, a question of a good going, system, going to backwards. a bad system where we are now into internalization, mm. whereby you, all of me, all of people individually are paid the same amount of money, yeah. yet none, nobody knows the responsibilities or additional costs that other people have, be yes. married or partners or whatever. Yeah, yeah. So. Yeah. yeah. But the other point, you know, that, that he's making is, again, he's under no illusion. When you're, when you're talking about a social issue, whatever it is, a social issue, a social issue really has to be decided Two things affected. One is the human beings who are, in, who are in relation to that social issue, whether it's a company, a village, a community, or whatever. Everybody has to be involved in that. It can't just be one person deciding, you see. Um, it's like uh, you can't just, how can I put this? You can't just take the ideas of somebody like Karl Marx who sits down in the British Museum, analyzes capitalism, and then says, well, we apply this. It's a case of this, this intuition, if we can see, if everybody can rise to the idea that we are threefold beings in ourselves, we are all consumers, we are all, um, sorry, we're all economic agents, we're all political agents, and we're all cultural agents at some point in our life, yes. If we can all experience ourselves as threefold beings, then you've got a basis where this is no longer just an abstraction. And something is coming out of the head of somebody, some individual, and is applied to society. Yeah. We, we each have to realize that we are threefold beings in ourselves. And not only that we have these three systems, physiological systems in ourselves, but as I said, that we operate in these three different ways as citizens, and that we also have bodies, souls, and spirits. Bodies, souls, and spirits. And not just bodies and souls. And that's that's a big one. Yeah. That you if you've got a spirit, if you recognise you have an individual spirit, then that is what is really, as it were, motivating your cultural and spiritual life. But that's something which actually was cut out of Western civilization a long time ago. And it would lead me too far afield to talk about that. But you it takes you right back into the Middle Ages when the church anathematized a certain and the church forbade a certain view of the human being as a threefold being, body, soul, and spirit, and said, you can't believe in that anymore. You have to accept that a human being is a being of body and soul. These two only. Right? Well, that's already getting close to the animal state of being. Animals have, the three sorry? The 
interesting, but God was threefold. Yes, yeah. But that is that's interesting, right? Because look what happened there. God was threefold, but we, particularly in the Protestant world, we lost sight of the Holy Spirit. Right. The Holy Spirit has only just been rediscovered by certain Protestant sects, you could say, in the 20th century. Right? But we lost sight of that. And we also lost sight of, in a way, particularly again in the Protestant world, there's you and there's Jehovah or there's God. And there's not much in between. In the Catholic world, you still have Mother Mary and the Virgin Mary, and you still have the saints. So there was still something in between. It was a bit vague. Or the difference between the seraphim and the cherubim and the angels was not at all clear anymore. So, what was existing between you and God, sort of transcendent, became increasingly hard to understand. Yeah? So, this threefoldness of Father, Son, and Holy Spirit gradually became more and more vague for people. Yeah? But it, it's really important that we realize that, um, for quite profound reasons, this decision was made a long time ago. I'm talking about back in the 9th century, a particular church council. That you're not a threefold being, you're a twofold being. And well, you can still see it in advertising in various places, body and soul. Um, and the whole idea of the binary, you know? Yes, 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 yes and no. Yeah, and of course. Yeah. All these One or not. Yeah, it's right back in there. But to, just to, to come back to Ray's point about the money, you see. But when you're talking about this kind of thing, it has to be the community itself. Social issues have to be decided by the community. And secondly, they have to be decided by those people who know the situation on the ground. So when, already hundred years ago, you know, people came to Steiner and said, well, concretely, what can we do here in Stuttgart about blah, 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 blah. Could you please give us a blueprint? And he said, well, no, because you know the situation here in Stuttgart. I don't. All I know, and I'm trying to get you to see, is that all of us are operating our economy on the wrong basis. And if we can just shift our thinking, and if you can realize that, then you in Stuttgart will see how you can organize your consumer distribution and producers groups and get together and work in a different way. You'll understand that because you've got your local reality here. The, the locals know what the situation is. They're in the best place to, to decide the situation. And does this have to do with Steiner movement, you know, the, that the impulse in, in, in the East, the Slavic impulse, the Russian impulse, that will, will come to, you know, hopefully in a good way, will, will, will manifest in the 60th epoch. In other words, cooperation, that now in this 50th epoch that we discover our individuality, but now we, the next step is to come, become more cooperative. Right, okay, well now Barry's talking about something there which might not be familiar to some of you. What I'm really yeah. saying though is that we become, I mean, obviously you have to be really careful of socialism and things like this, but the idea that, you know, we're, we're, we're individual, we've discovered our individuality, but that we have an interdependence. Right. But because we're kind of mature now that we do, we can get together and we can sort of talk and think together, mm -hmm. if you will. And that way we can actually understand these, these, these threefold ideas because we will, you know, it's obviously the, the balance between the, Maintaining our individuality, but somehow being able to work together, not be fighting with each other, not competing yeah. with each other mm -hmm. in the wrong places. Mm -hmm. That this would be the balance that you know we'll be moving towards. Yes. Yeah. Um, and maybe that can help to sort of tie things together as we come towards the end in a way, because obviously if you look back two thousand years, then the, the main focus of European civilization here, right, Greece and Rome. Um, I mean, civilization, when I say civilization, I mean kind of new developments. Obviously, what's going on in the tribal world, yeah, that had been going on for a long time. And it had also been going on here too, but then in the Greek or Roman world, you get civilization developing, new developments. The concept of the citizen, for example, unknown in these parts of the world, right? Whatever you think about that. But then, in the course of time, you see civilization. The northern world begins to become civilized, as it were, and then you get new developments happening, and that's what you're talking about, that the individual begins to be asserted, doesn't it? What you could call the, uh, yeah, the Middle Ages, basically. Reformation. Sorry? The Reformation. Sure. The Reformation, exactly. Like I was saying before, yeah. Luther and so on, right? So here, it's still a collective world. The emperor decides, the emperor of Rome decides, everybody shall be the same and have the same view. 
And then up here, this individual self-assertion comes out, right? I wish to decide for myself. But that then falls, in the 18th century, into selfishness. Because finally, anything of a religious and collective nature is given up. And finally, each individual is left entirely on their own. And, you know, in that situation, often individuals fell into complete egocentricity. And so you get an economic system and a political system which is based on egocentricity. Napoleon, Hitler, or... Um, Planck. <laughs> but now the challenge, which I think is what you're saying, right, is can we move beyond the kind of eye of an eagle or the alienated individual and find a new form of community which is not based on family, clan, genetics, physical, physiological things, right? But can it be based on a new understanding of what the human being is? What is a human being? And then we come to this question, robot, animal, what are we? Are you familiar with some of you with the name Ray Kurzweil? What? Ray Kurzweil. Yeah. Ray Kurzweil, transhumanism. Have oh, yes. you heard of transhumanism? Yes. Yeah. Well, he's an American cyberneticist yes, right. who is looking forward enthusiastically by the middle of this century to the end of biological humanity. So we will be able to download our consciousness into mechanical ceramic vehicles and computer intelligence will advance to the point where our pathetic little brainlets are no longer able to cope. So we're already advanced to the next level. So the end, in fact, de facto, of human beings. Yeah. So it's like a kind of general suicide. He's looking forward to that. Right? And the media, by the way, he's now the director of engineering at Google. <laughs> Google. Scary! <laughs> the, the, the singularity is moving. And the media are enthusiastically talking about it. So, by the end of this, uh, this century, certainly, he wrote a book in 1999 called The Age of Spiritual Machines, in which he laid out a sort of decade by decade uh, progress towards this state. So, the question is, you see, what is the concept we have? of a human being. What is our understanding of the human being? And that especially means consciousness. This is where we come to this question of the spirit that I mentioned. Are you only a body with feelings? Or have you got something else just with your feelings? Feelings are important. But feelings can often just be very personal. Yeah? In what's imagination? What is consciousness? This, I think, will be the real, the real key question in this century, right? How do we understand what a human being is? So you get Mr. Kurzweil saying, the robot future. And then you get other people saying, well, we're basically animals. And we should behave like animals. Sometimes out of a kind of mistaken compassion for animals. Of course it's right to have compassion for animals, but not to the extent of thinking, well, we are just animals. Yeah? So I think that's the, that's the problem. Barry was sort of pointing, I mean, what he was saying, to, well, we see how 2,000 years ago you've got this part of Europe was sort of dominant in a way. And then the Middle Ages and up to today, we see how this part of Europe becomes dominant, and the North. And America actually comes out of that, doesn't it? Right? The United States comes out particularly of this part, Northwest, doesn't it? But in the next sort of period of European development, it's going to be this part, the Slavic, Eastern Europe. And each one of these parts of Europe has made a contribution to European civilization. So our whole legal way of understanding the middle sphere, politics, law, has come from here. Yeah? What we are now developing in business and economics is actually coming from here since the 15th century. Yeah? What I said about the businessman becoming independent of the politician and priest. Well, now, in the next period, that's still far in the future yet. In the next period, a new form of social um, feeling, as it were, living together in community, which we can hardly even can imagine yet, in a sense, will develop here. And communism was a premature intuition of that. Yeah? The brotherhood of man. And it attempted to come from here, but the time was not right. It came too soon. And there are two forms of evil, as it were. There's the form which drags you back into the past 
and the thought which pushes you prematurely into the future before you're ready for it. And that's what happened with communism. Fascism drags you back into the past. Remember Hitler? Fascism is the Roman spirit. And communism was pushing us forward into the future before we were ready for it. But that will, not communism as we have in the 20th century, but some form of brotherly and sisterly communal life based on a, a, a higher feeling life, which we can hardly even imagine yet, will in fact be the future development. Well, that's why I had to tell you, that's a long term ahead of the future. Six epoch. Yes, yeah, yeah, yeah that's what, what he calls yeah. it. The six epoch, the time when this, these people above all make a contribution. Now, there are certain elite forces which don't want that to happen for various reasons. Yeah? As I said, the elite forces are there to give us the resistance to develop our freedom as human beings. So, just as you see the middle elements, remember the picture of the balance that I showed you earlier with this and this, and then the the, the balance, yeah? The elite forces, uh, the this and the this, always try to cut out the middle. You, you see that again and again in history. The middle term is removed. What you said about computer? Yes, no, yes, no, yes, no, on off, on off. Right? Always two. Right? So we always have to, three, it's not two, it's three. So there's always the attempt to destroy the middle. In much of European history, in the 17th century, we had the Thirty Years' War here. In the 20th century, we had again Thirty Years' War here. And so, but now, the global scale, Russia, which stretches right from Europe right over to Asia, becomes, as it were, the global middle, in a certain sense. And there will be the aim to uh, destroy Russia. Let me just give you an illustration of that, um, if I can. Um, you know. Oh, sorry. You probably heard um, of this man, um, Zbigniew Brzezinski. He was uh, President Clint, uh, President uh, Carter's advisor in the 1970s, and uh, this. He, was advising uh, Obama during his uh, campaign in 2008. Uh, his sons are very high up in um, American politics. His daughter's on TV as an anchor woman, and so on. Um, he's still very influential, Brzezinski. And here he writes in the leading American foreign policy, foreign affairs think tank, geostrategy for Asia. This is his view of the future. Look at the flag here. European Union flag inside America. <laughs> Transatlantic Union. That's from the Economist. These powers work together. These are the Anglo American elite, as it were. He looks for, this is 1997, by the way, Atlanticist Europe. The goal to join these two things together, America and Europe, goes back to the 1990s. So it's Atlanticist Europe, which includes Turkey and Ukraine, you see. And then here you have Greater China. And the Anglo-Americans have given China a certain control over this part of, of Asia, well, he has. But look at Russia. Russia is to be divided into three parts. And here you've got the Far Eastern Republic. That's to be separated off. That was already attempted in 1919, but it didn't work then. And the goal is basically to break the connection of Russia, to join east and west, so break this bridge and hand over, as it were, these parts of Russia to Asia. And forgive me, I'm sort of summarizing articles and various things here. To hand these over to Asia, and then Russia will be drawn into Atlanticist Europe, do you see? So it will no longer be a bridging culture as it is at the moment. It will just become part of Europe, which means part of Euro-America. Yeah? So these are these guys, they're like Brzezinski's book, which he published in 1997, it's called The Grand Chessboard. <laughs> and that's how, they, that's how they see themselves, yeah? Playing chess on this with people's lives and cultures' lives for far, far reaching purposes. And we've got to get wise to what they, what they are planning for us, yeah? Otherwise, we end up with scenarios like World War I and World War II, and, you know, Anyway, um, so that's 
that's part of the ugly future. And, and in a sense, like Barry was mentioning, he, they are trying to prevent the Slavic peoples from playing the role that they should play in the future. Already now, they are preparing for that, you see? And he has got a Brzezinski, he's cut this name, you know, he's come from there. It's a, yeah, yeah, exactly. You know, he says he's, he's a Polish, he's aware, a Polish he's aware of his heritage, yes, he's yes. denying it. Exactly, he comes from Polish aristocratic. Yeah, yeah. yeah, so he's, he's yeah. well, well yeah. placed to say that. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so. mm -hmm. there you go. Anyway, to finish then, um, I would say that uh, what we are in Europe, what we're sort of faced with is um, this situation. So you've got these, we've got three choices really in, in Europe. The first choice is this, monolith. The European Union monolith. And what that means is that, you know, the American Civil War, before the American Civil War, America was a rather loose union. But because of the war, it became a very tight union. So America, after Lincoln, was very tight Confederation. Please don't misunderstand me, I'm not sort of criticizing Lincoln in there, he's a very good man in many respects, yeah? But just the circumstances of the war and fighting the war made the United States something other than what it was. Just like Britain, for example, because of World War I, became a completely different, much more tightly organized, centrally controlled society than it had been in 1914. And we are stepping into this one pattern future in the European Union, step by inexorable step, now. Yeah, unless we kind of wake up to that. The people who oppose that, some of them, say, let's return, like Mr. Nigel Farage, in Britain, you might have heard of him, the United Kingdom Independence Party, I'm sure you've got your equivalent in Ireland. Let's exit the European Union, to hell with Europe, and let's go back to our, our wonderful age of um, nation states such as we had in the, you know, from the 16th to the 18th, 19th century, right? Well, that's no solution either. Unitary nation states, where basically the government and the business and the confusion again. That's just going back to the past. We can't just go back to this threefold confusion, which we had during the age of nation states, when the state was basically controlling everything. So the, I think the real future is for the threefold commonwealth in Europe. Not a unitary European state, but a state in which you will have, for example, and not, I shouldn't say state, but an association, I'll put it that way, an association of European countries, a loose association, where you've got a European economy organized in a threefold way, produ European producers, European consumers, European distributors operating together, You've got a free uh, cultural realm where artists and scientists across Europe uh, should be free to interact with each other freely, as in many respects they were in the Middle Ages. But in a political realm, it's the political realm where each of our countries has its own traditions, its own laws, its own customs. And they ought to be respected for what they are, because they've evolved over time, reflecting the realities of the people in those countries. Isn't it a really bit late for Europe to be defined as, you know, as, a, as an isolated item on the agenda? It's like, to me, the, you know, the Africans are coming into Italy, you know, it was like mm -hmm. phases every day, every day is people drowning in, in the sea, you know, because of the inequality in, in development and in, yeah. in, 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 right. in the whole the whole manipulation in the market and so on yes. and so you've got people there who are not oblivious that there's Europe, you know, they know there's Europe, yeah, yeah. but they're prevented from right. from migrating freely. And that's part I mean I think that this this kind of funny idea of this Europe being sort of a thing in itself that can make up its own idea mm -hmm. of, of a future mm -hmm. is already somehow mistaken, you know, yeah, because you there's, see, there's a lot more around it and it's all flowing and it's all coming back and forth and what is happening in Greece and all these people. I mean Greece is becoming a, you know just a dumping ground for people who come from from beyond. <laughs> right. Okay. And, and are not allowed to be anything. 
Yeah. But see, for example, but already in, in uh, the, again, at the end of the First World War, you get the first attempt to create a world government in the, in the League of Nations. Right? That failed. So they tried again with the United Nations in 1945. They tried to jump ahead from the nation state, which we had in the 19th century, straight away into world state. And they tried to create a world state on the same unitary model as on the nation state. That can't work. You're trying to jump too far into the future, too fast. It's, it's a kind of parallel to what happened in communism. It's what the capitalist elite did, similar to the communist elite, if you will, trying to jump too far into the future. Maybe sometime far distant in the future, we will have, as it were, one world, if you will. But that time will not be yet. We have to proceed in a more realistic fashion. You know? And so just as we can see that in the past of Ireland or the past of England, you've got little small um, you know, clanlets or uh, little kingdoms. We had seven kingdoms in England, for example, the Saxon kingdoms. And then gradually you get one. Yeah? And then these evolve further into larger entities. This takes time. We cannot rush these processes artificially. Yeah? So the next step on from a nation state is a, indeed a continental organism. The question is, what will that continental organism be like? Will it be like an old nation state, tight central control of confused politics, business and culture? Or will it be a more mobile, um, truly human threefold association? The, uh, continental organism. Yeah, that's that's I think the question. But to jump straight into to try to jump straight into kind of all world government, I think is really problematic. So I go from the point, <coughs> individual, to the periphery, the global periphery. Yeah? And there's what's in between is left out. Yeah, but the world has moved on. What you're talking about happened in the past, and you're talking about a world that was. Uh, pre, and I just started looking at a world that was pre First World War and so forth, but people have moved on. Indeed, within this country, mm. you will find that most people, those they, their problems about Europe, voted quite happily to be part of this greater thing, which has given yeah. so much to this country. Wow. Phenomenal amount. Mm -hmm. It has provided a discipline, it has provided new laws, it has provided fairness, equality, absolutely everything that people in this country largely have been looking for. That is not to say that I'm a, a Europhile, I see yes. issues about it there. But from the benefit of the community, mm. it has been so much better. And that is why, even from the point of view of having a, a Euro, which mm. uh, I believe in, because I think I like when I go abroad using the same money, knowing mm. precisely how much I'm in charge and can make a correct correspondence. Mm -hmm. um, I, it, while I see edges and issues that ought to be uh, clarified in mm -hmm. Europe, I think it's better all around for us. It's better all around. Yes. Yeah. Thank like you. Say, yeah. what, what is the thing to say? I see where you're coming from. And the threefold commonwealth of Europe, it's the it concept is that it's better for us, and that's part maybe of the greater problem. It's better for us. Um, is it better? And it's by no kind of fluke of actions mm -hmm. that we haven't had war in Europe, no. apart from okay, the Balkans, but a, a kind of, where the previous 50 years mm -hmm. uh, you had, after 19, uh, before 1950, you had huge conflicts, and we had always other conflicts before that. Yeah. So uh, we've arrived at a stage now where we say it's not perfect, but how do we go forward to make it better? And in terms of a kind of a world thing, we can't work in Europe. It's like when we have a, a threefold commonwealth of Europe that works very well for us, yet exploit other countries or other parts of the world. We need to be able to, if we have our principles which work best 